As long as this, this is his day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of, pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out in the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time, the son of the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said, we know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they held insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this this replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What, are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. 
But now that you've claimed that you can see, your guilt remains. Good, hopefully you've got a Bible open to John chapter 9. As a church, we've been looking at John's Gospel through this time well from chapter 5 in John's Gospel. We've got to chapter 9 today. You will... Um, there is some uh, sermon note sheets across on the side if anybody would uh, like one of uh, those. Um, and it's got a table in it which might be uh, helpful um, as we go through, hopefully become clear as we go uh, through. But yeah, but let me uh, pray uh, once again. Let's pray together. Father God, we do thank you that your word contains the words of eternal life. And that when we come to you humbly, Listening to what you say, you give us uh, that life. You give us joy. uh, You give us delight. Uh, And Father, we pray that you would help us this morning to come to your word uh, and with that heart. And that we would uh, listen to your word and that you would change us. For we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. John's uh, gospel is a great gospel. He tells us right at the end that the reason why he has uh, written the gospel uh, you might remember, it's on, on the screen here. John uh, 20, verse 30 and 31, we read, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Uh, John tells us at the end of his uh, gospel that he wants us to uh, listen to this word, to read the Bible, read this part of the scripture, so that we might believe in Jesus and have eternal life. And we've seen some of those signs that Jesus has been doing which have pointed to that. Do you remember back in chapter 5, Jesus healed, um, healed the man and he said, I am equal with God and I have the same authority as God and you should honour me as you would honour God the Father. In chapter 6, he said, I am the bread of life. I can give you all that is necessary for life. In chapter 7, he said, I can provide living water. In chapter 8, he said, I am the light of the world. And Jesus said and, uh, amazing things about uh, who he is as the Christ, the Messiah. Amazing things, you remember, which are all backed up by the amazing signs Jesus did. Do you remember in chapter 5, he healed the man who had been uh, disabled for 30 odd years by the pool. Um, in, chapter, um, in the next chapter, he fed the 5,000. Do you remember, it was probably more like 20,000 if you added in all the women and the children as well. He fed uh, those with just a little bit of food. He walked in the water. It, it, it's all these things which are amazing things, which help us to believe that Jesus is the Christ. But along with all those things, these amazing signs, the life-changing treatment, the, the comforting truths that we've been led in, if you don't notice as we've gone through chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, that they're also marked by arguments, by rejection, by hostility. And John says his purpose is that people might believe, and yet as you read through, you just see people arguing, fighting, disagreeing, and in fact, you see in chapter 5, people are wanting to kill Jesus. In chapter 6, they're grumbling about him. In chapter 7, they're trying to arrest him. In chapter 8, they're trying to stone him to death. You see, as you go through, you, it seems that there's this uh, confusion going on. John wants to persuade his readers that we can believe in Jesus and have eternal life. But to leave the question hanging in these chapters... What will it take for people to believe? What will it take for people to believe? It's a question that we we ask, isn't it? But it's also a question which people around us and Christians will give a variety of different answers to. So for example, Janice might say, if I could have seen Jesus, I would have believed in him. Or if God shows himself to me now, then if I see him in some supernatural way, I'll believe. Or Ian, he's a bit like uh, Janice, he might say he's a a chemical engineer, and he says, look, if God did a miracle right in front of me, then I would have no option but to believe. Something which I I can't deny. He did that back in the day, he gave sight to the blind, he helped those who couldn't walk, walk. 
If that were to happen to me now, then I would believe the evidence would be overwhelming. Bob, on the other hand, is a lawyer, and he's used to making logical, coherent arguments, and he thinks if he could could understand Christianity better and be clear and persuasive in the way he speaks to those around him, then they would believe. And so he spends lots of time studying apologetics. He's read C.S. Lewis, he's read uh, Tim Keller, he knows all the arguments against the new atheists. And Bill says, if I can keep on top of all of those and can tell people, then they'll become Christians. Kirsten, though, she thinks if I could just show people that Christianity does good, then people would come to believe in Jesus. And so she commits all her energy into uh, social action, thinking that will make people believe. Sean, he's a musician, and he thinks if he could help people to experience Christianity, that's what will help them believe. And so he uh, takes his friends to loads of events, particularly those ones where he feels close to God. Do you recognise those kind of people? I think I've met all of those uh, people, obviously not with those names, but I've met people who, who think that if, they, if, we, if we get those things right, then people will become Christians. And, and you know, there's some truth in all of those things, isn't there? And they want their friends to believe. They want their friends to come to faith in Christ. And yet they're disappointed because they don't see it. And so they ask again, what would make my friends believe in Christ? What would make Alice, Adam, Anna, Abby and Andy believe, to pick some names within the beginning with A? How will they believe? How will they see? I think in some ways that's the the point of uh, John chapter 9. It comes at this point in the gospel after there's been all this rejection, all this fighting, all this argument, all this people seeming to reject Jesus. And it starts to answer the question of why that is happening. And it does that through this brilliant interaction between this man who was born blind and the Pharisees. And we'll see what it would take for someone to believe. But it also helps to explain the reasons why people don't. I think the key to the chapter is in verse 39, if you, it's on page 1076, it's on, after I've had to flip my page, and you might need to do the same. Verse 39, Jesus says this, For judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Jesus is saying here, he is come into the world for judgment. I think in a sense what he's meaning there, he's come into the world for for separation, to separate people out, to make a distinction. And so those who are blind will see, those who come to recognise they have a, a need, and that Jesus can meet that need and heal them, they see this part of the separation happening. On the other hand, there are those who think they can see. I think they're probably the proud group and they will become blind <coughs> and we see it working itself out in this chapter itself and so we're going to look in a little bit more detail through the, the chapter to see how this kind of plays out in the lives of the Pharisees and the man born uh, blind to see how that distinction is made but first, we look at the, just as a way to kind of see the, how the chapter starts to this man who was given sight, a blind man given sight. You see, this section starts in verse um, 2 with the disciples' question. Um, they want to know why the man's born blind, and they think someone must have sinned for that to happen, done something wrong, whether it was the man himself or his parents. Jesus makes a staggering claim in verse 3. He says, Neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. No, it happened so that the work of God might be displayed in him. He was born blind so he could come to this position, so he could be given sight and come to know Jesus. And Jesus goes on to uh, display some of that work. You see what he says, verse 4, As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. 
While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You see, Jesus playing on these themes of darkness and light, night and day. And then he literally gives light to the man. He literally brings this man to see. I don't, I, I don't claim to know what it's like to be dark, to be blind. But I imagine it's a bit like having your eyes closed all the time. Do you know when you have your eyes closed? And behind your eyelids, it, it's dark, isn't it? There's kind of blackness behind your eyelids. I imagine it's a bit like that. This man was in the dark. But then he is given light. He can see. You see, Jesus heals this man. He, he, puts, he makes the mud, he puts it in his eye. He says, go and wash in this pool. And the man does it. And, and he can see. But then it's a sign which is explained in the rest of the, the chapter. And it, I think the chapter, it kind of centres around all these different, I've called them interviews or interrogations that go on. And the main characters are, the, are this, this man born blind and the Pharisee. And I think what we'll see is, if we look through, you will see that the man grows in his understanding of who Jesus is. But the religious leaders, the Pharisees, are diminishing in sight. Let's see if we can track it through. That's where the, the table in, the, in the, um, the sermon notes sheet comes in if you want that. will be some of it up on the screen as well. But the first interview, interview uh, one, is between the man born blind um, and his neighbours, a group of uh, neighbours around. You see, because the man is healed, uh, you see it um, in, in verse uh, 7. And then his neighbours and those around him, they, they're, they're a bit confused, thinking, well, this can't be the same man because he's seeing. And others say, no, that's definitely, that's definitely him. And so they come to him. Um, and the, Sorry, the man insists in verse 9, I am the man. And so the people say to him, well, how then were your eyes opened? And in verse 11, we start to see the man's understanding at this point. See what he says? The man they call Jesus. That's his understanding at that point. And then he, he kind of says, what happened? The man they saw Jesus. So if you look at the table, that's, that's what he sees at this point. The man they called Jesus. But then we move to the, the second interview. And this time it's the, the former blind man meeting the Pharisees for the first time. And so he recounts again what's happened, and we, and we see something of the Pharisees' understanding in verse 16. See what they're saying? Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? And so they were divided. You see what their, their, their understanding is? It comes back up on the screen here. He's not from God, but how can he do these things? You see, there's a, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, a confusion. They're saying, well, some things he's a good for nothing because he's doing stuff in the sun, and that can't be right, and so he can't be from God. And others are going, but maybe, maybe there's something going on. How could, a, how could a good for nothing do something so good? And so they're pondering that question. And so they ask the man again, what have you got to say about him? It was your eyes who were open to see you in verse 17 when the man answers. The man replied, he is a prophet. And so can you see the man's understanding is increasing. The man they call Jesus, he's a prophet. With the Pharisees, they're not, they're not happy. And so then we move to interview three, where the, the Pharisees meet with the man's parents. And in this section, we see the Pharisees are becoming very sceptical. You see, the first of the, you see, when we read through, they were questioning the parents whether their son was really born blind. Maybe, maybe the parents had made a mistake and he wasn't actually born blind. They'd just been pretending about it. The, the parents don't fully answer, you see, as they go through, and they're unwilling to say how he was healed. And they tell the Pharisees, just ask him, he's of age, he's old enough. And you see why in verse 22. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And so when you get back to the table, you see what they are, what they are now saying. They are saying, we will put you out of the synagogue. We will put you out of this religious institution, this 
cultural centre, this place where you belong, we will put you out if you think that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, it starts to take a, a little bit of a nasty turn there with that comment, doesn't it? That these Pharisees, they're closing their minds to the possibility that they might need Jesus and that he could be the Messiah. The Pharisees' understanding is going down. Well, then we turn to interview four, and again, it's between the man and the Pharisees again. So verse 24, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they say, by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. It's interesting, isn't it? They're saying, the, the Pharisees here, they're saying to this man, tell the truth, don't lie. I think by implication they're saying, we, we know that you must be lying. This can't be the story. And you see their position about Jesus now, at the end of verse 24. We know this man is a sinner. Their even-handed investigation into Jesus is starting to crumble, isn't it? They're convinced that Jesus is a sinner, not someone to be listened to. And so they asked the man born blind again what Jesus did. And listen to his answer in verse 27. I've already told you, you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? I love this bit. Do you want to become his disciples too? Do you want to become his disciples too? Do you want to be a follower of Jesus? I don't think there was anything more likely to enrage the Pharisees at this point than that. And you see the effect it had on the Pharisees? Verse 28 and 29. Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. See their understanding here? It's going down again, isn't it? We are followers of Moses. But do you remember earlier in chapter 7, Jesus said that they weren't really followers of Moses. Verse 19 of chapter 7. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Trying to kill Jesus for the, doing the things he came to do. Doing the things that the law pointed to. So they make a ridiculous claim. They don't want to know Jesus. And then the man replies again, and it's like he's just kind of sets up a little bomb in the midst of the, the, the Pharisees. Verse uh, 30. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does as well. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so when we get to the, the table again, we see now that the man is saying, he is from God. But the Pharisees, they think he's a sinner. They don't have anything to do with him. It's interesting what the Pharisees do here. They, they could have argued the, the point with him, the, the kind of theological point. You know, that they're, well, do you know, blind man, there's examples of false teachers in the past who did amazing things. That doesn't necessarily mean it's from God, but they don't do that. Look what they do in verse 34. They personally abused this man. They replied to him, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. It's a bit irony in those verses, isn't it? Now they've been trying to argue all along that this man wasn't blind. But now they seem to be saying, no, you were steeped in sin at birth. That's why you're a blind man in the first place. We're not going to listen to you. Do you see what's happening to the Pharisees? It's as if they're becoming more and more blind. 
Where's the man? He's, his sight is growing. And in the last interview of the chapter, we see it, in a sense, coming to completion as the blind man gets to see Jesus for the very first time with his own eyes. See verse 35, Jesus heard they'd thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, Son of Man? replied, Tell me, so that I might believe in him. Jesus says, You've now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And what happens? Verse 38, the man says, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped Jesus. Lord, I believe. And he worships Jesus. He believes in Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of Man. And we come back to the explanation of verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world that the blind will see, and those who will see will become blind. Can you see what's happening through the chapter? This man who was physically blind, in a sense was spiritually blind too, but had been given sight. Whereas the man, the, the Pharisees who said they could see, they were the religious heavyweights, they thought they knew it all, were becoming blind. As we draw towards a close, notice the, a couple of implications from this. The first one's there. And we see this man who was physically blind, standing for what we are all like spiritually. And how is it we come to believe? Well, it's because Jesus makes the blind see. And we have to see that, don't we? We have, to, we have to remember this. It is Jesus who will make people see, who will make people believe. It's God's action in a person. It takes a miracle for somebody to believe, but the miracle is that they will be given sight. You see, the Pharisees, they had, they had had it all. They'd seen the miracles. They saw the man paralyzed for 38 years and healed. They'd seen Jesus feed the 20 odd thousand people. They'd seen the, uh, the man given sight. They listened to Jesus' amazing teaching, and yet they're becoming more and more blind. They don't see. What would it take for them to believe? They need a miracle in their lives. Someone who will help them see, who will help them understand. And without God opening the eyes of the blind, no one will see. And so, as we think about our um, conversations we have with our friends, as we are, uh, speak to them about Jesus, as we desire them to come to faith in Christ, we have to see that Jesus is the one who will give sight, and so we need to pray. Don't we need to ask that God would give sight to the blind? We can't persuade anyone to come to faith in Christ. We need God to give sight to the blind. Now please don't mishear me as I say that. I'm not saying that that means don't speak to your friends and just pray. I'm just saying we need to pray more as we speak to our friends. God calls us to testify to Jesus, to speak to them about Jesus, to, to tell them the good news. But sometimes we think it's just through all of my actions that that's how they're going to come to faith in Christ. But we need a miracle. And so we pray. And so will you commit to praying for your friends, neighbours, family? And yet the other side to this chapter that we uh, learn is that there are people who have great privilege. They are around the gospel, they hear the amazing news, and yet they never make a commitment to Christ. I was once at an event which was speaking about the amazing evidence there is for Jesus, and it's, and it's enormous. And someone in the, in the audience asked the question, in view of the overwhelming evidence, why don't people believe? That's kind of what this chapter shows, isn't it? And what we see here is those who think they see are blinded. We see some of that in the Pharisees, don't we? They thought they saw. They thought they were religious. 
They thought they understood the world and God and everything in it, and yet they end up being blind. Look how the chapter ends in verse 40. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Once you go through the chapter, you think, well, you might be able to physically see. You might be very intelligent. You might have theological degrees. You might understand the Bible. We would have to say they are blind, aren't they? And the effect of the gospel coming, which says you need to be humble. You need to see you have need. You need to believe in Jesus for eternal life has the effect of turning them away and blinding them. It seems that they do that in the end because it challenges their position. Because to do something else would mean they'd have to admit they need a saviour. Whereas they want to kill Jesus and do away with him. And we've seen through the chapter where they don't keep the law they don't do the good. They show that their hearts were rotten. And even the small sparks that was there in their life seems to be beginning to be doused. They are completely in darkness. And so can I say to you, those of you here today who don't really believe, can you see that these verses stand as a great warning to you? It's possible to hear the good news and turn away from Christ. And so can I appeal to you, don't make that choice. But come to see that Jesus is the one who came from his Father, who lived on earth, who died in your place, who rose again to give you life. And come to him. Well, let me read this in a final prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, that he came from you to this world to bring life. Father, would you help us to accept him in our lives, to trust in him and to follow him and to keep him at the very centre. Father, would you keep us from being like these Pharisees who thought they were so clear-sighted and yet we're becoming blind. <clears throat> and Father, would you help us to commit to praying for our friends and our neighbours and our family that they might come to know the Lord Jesus for themselves. And Father, would you open the blind eyes around us to see the wonderful news of Jesus. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Your word is alive.